Chapter 11 The Ocean and Fisheries This chapter starts off talking about just one of the many problems that we face regarding our ocean's resources. For example, fish species that are highly sought after, species like uh, tuna, which this section talks about, shark, swordfish, are being depleted at, at uh, alarming levels. Tuna alone, the bluefin tuna, are being fished at four times the level that would be sustainable. And because the tuna have such a high economic value, like anything else, if there's money to be had, people will typically exploit that resource. The economic value these tuna have, especially in, in certain places in the world, uh, some of the developed countries, countries like uh, Japan, the U.S., uh, this is really putting the tuna in danger. There certainly are conservation measures in place, like there are for most any resource that, uh, that there's a demand for. But again, when there's that much money to be made, one large tuna could be worth thousands and thousands of dollars. So that means that illegal harvesting is still... Uh, basically occurring pretty widespread and uh, because of that illegal harvesting the the, um, the yearly limits are being exceeded because again the combination of the legal take and all of the illegal harvesting are exceeding the quotas and again this isn't just a problem with bluefin tuna overfishing of, of other species like I've already mentioned are, are basically occurring at rates faster than those fish can reproduce. 80% of fish species have been overfished. 95% of some of the commercial fish stocks in the U.S. are being overfished. And so if we continue to overfish our, uh, our high demand species, and if we continue to pollute our ocean worldwide, developed countries and undeveloped countries alike, if those things aren't fixed or addressed completely, we could have complete depletion of certain seafood species within the next 30, 40 years, based on the, the information that your book is talking about. Again, I think part of the problem is people, people don't think long term. They're thinking about now, making money now, meeting a need now. Um, you know, who cares about 50 years from now? Somebody will probably, you know, find a, a, a way to fix the problem before we actually run out. But as I've mentioned multiple times, that is exactly the problem that we face with all of our resource consumption. We want somebody else to fix it tomorrow instead of each of us taking responsibility to do our part today. Part of the challenge or, or reason that we kind of exploit a resource like the ocean is it's so huge. Our global oceans cover three quarters of the surface of the earth. Basically, they are one continuous body of water, although we've separated them into the Atlantic, Pacific, Indian, and Arctic oceans because of sort of natural boundaries created by the continents. But again, the problem has always been that the oceans are so large, we believe that there is just no way that we can really damage the resource. Just like people believe there is no way that global warming can be caused by humans, because the world's too big for that, you know, for us as humans to have an impact. But again, we know scientifically, we can see it, that we are having an impact on this planet. And even things as large as our oceans are being impacted by us being on this planet. If we look at the patterns uh, that create circulation of our oceans, we're again kind of going back to the fact that it's largely a combination of effects. The winds, the, especially the trade winds that, that always kind of blow in a consistent direction over the surface of the ocean as well as across the land, produce currents. And so this creates mass movement of the ocean water on the surface of the ocean. Um, and then because of the rotation of the earth, we basically also enhance that circulation pattern where basically the clockwise gyre, however you want to pronounce that, 
um, in the North Atlantic creates the, the other part of this circulation. And again, that's because of the Coriolis effect. The fact that the Earth is rotating and this causes the ocean currents to kind of swerve or move around. They go to the right in the northern hemisphere, which is clockwise, and they go to the left in the southern hemisphere, which is counterclockwise. Again, north or south of the equator, of course. We've already kind of looked at the global wind patterns and how that affects temperature. Again, the same patterns affect the ocean currents and, uh, again, ultimately, the, the way that the ocean water flows is greatly impacted by the combination of the wind and the rotation of the earth. This figure um, kind of illustrates again the global uh, patterns of ocean flow that are predictable. The North Atlantic drift that kind of goes from the uh, near the Gulf of Mexico, the Caribbean, up northward towards the uh, you know, Greenland, Iceland, that area. And then also you get the North Atlantic e equatorial current that kind of swoops around Europe southward across the northern part of Africa and back towards the, the Caribbean. And again, uh, you can see the other, the other patterns kind of worldwide that are predictable patterns, again, related to the air and the Coriolis effect of the earth spinning. The other component to this, we, we previously mentioned the surface currents, but there also is a vertical mixing of ocean water. The same issue with air. Warmer air tends to rise because it's lighter, uh, because it's not as dense as cold air you get the same sort of stratification of ocean water or lake water for that matter but basically you've got seawater and because of its density um, will ultimately um, when it's uh, colder will uh, be denser so it tends to push downward into the depths of the ocean Whereas, again, the warmer water is less dense and it tends to be pushed upward. And again, warmer water is also less salty, so that affects the density as well. And so you get that vertical mixing because of the difference in salinity and, and ultimately because of the difference in density and temperature. And then, of course, that Coriolis effect, again, has an impact because it's stronger at greater depths. Deep ocean currents travel in different directions oftentimes than the surface currents do. So you may have a surface current moving east to west and then as that uh, you know water the density of the water affects its vertical movement the water sinks and then oftentimes will move the opposite direction. So you not only have this again surface movement but you also have the, the uh, the water moving in opposite directions, kind of a conveyor belt it's called, the ocean conveyor belt, where again you have water that moves deep, salty seawater from higher moves to lower latitudes, the water warms up, it rises back near the surface, moves across the surface currents where it might cool down again and sink, and basically it's, it's uh, enough of an impact that it can affect not only climates regionally, war, uh, Europe, for example, would be, um, would be much cooler, much colder than it is were it not for the Gulf Stream. Uh, again, those warmer waters being pushed, they're being warmed near the equator, near the tropics, and being pushed up through the Gulf Stream towards the north. There's some concern that with enough effect on the climate that this uh, impact of climate change could be enough to change the uh, ocean conveyor belt patterns. If, for example, the Gulf Stream flow were to be disrupted, in other words, that warmer water didn't get pushed northward uh, towards Europe, it could substantially change the climate in Europe, make it much, much colder than it is now. And again, ultimately that would have a huge impact on us 
It would have a huge impact on the local climate, huge impact on the ability to grow the type of crops that maybe we grow now. Um, lots of different things could be impacted. And again, it, it's, it seems like something this huge that, that we couldn't, as humans, possibly affect it. But, but scientists are showing that there is a strong likelihood that we are having an impact on these things. And if it gets worse than it is now, we could impact things like ocean currents. So again, that's why we need to be thinking about this now. So again, this, this figure just kind of shows one of those large conveyor belt systems. Again, you got water moving uh, near the surface that moves along the southern hemisphere. Actually, you know, the equator in the southern hemisphere gets pushed north into the Gulf Stream, circulates up around Europe. Again, it gets north, farther north, cools down. That heavier water sinks and then pushes back south and, and back towards the east, under or below, south of Africa, back south of Australia, where the currents kind of push it back to the north as it gets into the equatorial region. The water warms, rises back to the surface off of the Pacific Ocean. You can see the U.S. way off there in the upper right corner where again that water reaches the surface, warms up again, and continues its pass, path back westward towards Africa and, and ultimately back towards the, the European continent. So again, it's, it's important as an environmental scientist to understand the interaction between the ocean and the atmosphere. Winds from the atmosphere affect ocean currents and heat from the ocean affect the atmosphere and how the atmosphere circulates. And so one of the specific things here that are important for us to understand are weather patterns, long-term weather patterns and short-term weather patterns that are created because of the interaction between the ocean and the atmosphere. One of those patterns that can have a, a, uh, an annual effect on climate is the El Nino Southern Oscillation or ENSO pattern or typically we just refer to it as the El Nino. This uh, pattern is responsible for interannual climate variation, so climate variations that occur within the course of a year. Depending on how strong this oscillation is, it can create periods where we are wetter or cooler or drier or warmer than other years when this pattern is stronger or weaker. Now normally, the westerly trade winds, if we go back to the, the atmosphere chapter and look at those figures that show the, the westerly trade winds, basically those winds typically restrict the really warmer waters from getting to the western Pacific near Australia. However, every three to seven years on average, those trade winds are a little weaker than normal. So this allows a, a warmer air mass to actually expand to South America, making those uh, surface temperatures of the ocean warmer. And so this actually then slows down the ocean currents and they may even sort of stop in some situations. They don't move as far as they would normally move. So either they slow down dramatically or they actually stop for a period of time. Uh, again, this series of images show kind of comparing normal climate conditions where again we have those trade winds blowing uh, east to west across the equator, creating that, that lower uh, pressure system. You get heavy rainfall, that air mass cools, rises moves back to the east over the North American continent, but you have dry air. So you create high pressure systems that, that keep rainfall from falling. And this is kind of the pattern uh, that we in California, the western United States, has been in for these past couple of months. We had that long dry period where we had high pressure in place. We didn't have um, the ability for any strong enough systems to push that high pressure out of the way to allow there to be precipitation. And so what 
that can create then is, is an accumulation of that warm water uh, in the uh, south equatorial region where that south equator, south equatorial current stays pretty warm and it creates nice upwelling of nutrients over South America. But again, it kind of creates a blockade towards moisture and, and again, you know, low pressure systems to move over North America. Compare that to the uh, situation where we have an ENSO event. The warm water flows more eastward uh, to South America than being trapped over the South Pacific, like we see in the figure A. And so then again, we have that warm air mass um, actually descending and moving eastward, the opposite flow basically, that weak trade wind then doesn't block that warm water from making it all the way to South America, Central America, and, and southern parts of um, the United States. So we have the descending air mass that causes high pressure over the Asian continent. We have warm air mass rising uh, over North America creating low pressure and again therefore heavy rainfall events. And then the other part of that is that that upwelling of, of, uh, of, of water is blocked because you have that big mass of warm water trapped closer to the surface. So again the bottom line is when there's this ENSO pattern in place, this ENSO op oscillation, it basically results in, in more rainfall for, uh, for North America, for us in the West and for much of the rest of North America. Normal conditions, we don't get as heavy a rainfall. So ultimately this oscillation can alter global air currents. From 1997 to 1998, there were 20,000 deaths and billions and billions of dollars of property damage that were created because of this oscillation. Heavy snows in the western US, ice storms all the way across the country into eastern Canada. Not just heavy rains, but torrential rains in places like California um, and, and places in Central and South America as well as Western Europe. But then the other side of that, again, if, if some places are affected with more rain, other places are going to be much drier. We actually, during that period of time, had a very, very dry uh, period in Australia, uh, the South Pacific countries like Indonesia, even the central United States, cent South Central U.S. into Texas, experienced droughts during these times. So how do we actually determine if we're going to be experiencing one of these um, El Nino events. Well, we have this array of monitors that are spread across the ocean. The TAO slash Triton array is used to monitor not only surface temperatures, but also winds. And as we can start seeing trends appear with respect to, again, the ocean temperatures or the strength of the current, the wind, we can use that to forecast uh, the the uh, potential for uh, an El Nino event and hopefully also then better understand these events how strong they're going to be how big of an impact they might have if we know a droughts coming or likely to happen because we're going to get an ENSO event um, meaning a drought in places like South Central US Australia it's not like we can change the weather to avoid a drought but we can go into conservation mode ahead of time if we know that's going to be a problem. We can be, be sure to you know, prepare for it as much as possible. Don't wait until we're in the middle of a drought to put in restrictions for water use. If we know or could predict it months or, or longer ahead of time, we start putting those restrictions in place ahead of time, far enough ahead of time that we can maybe be a little bit better prepared for an event like that. There's also another type of oscillation, the La Nina event, where 
surface water temperatures in the eastern Pacific become unusually cool. So instead of becoming warmer than average, they become cooler than average. Part of this uh, is impacted by the western trade winds becoming much stronger than they typically are. And typically, um, the La Nina events occur after an El Nino event. Scientists have uh, determined, though, that these are much more difficult to predict the effects of a La Nina event. Typically, from, from historic records, since we've been paying attention to these things, we typically find that we have a wetter than usual winter in the Pacific Northwest with a La Nina event, warmer weather in the southwestern United States, and also a stronger hurricane season and more hurricanes in the Atlantic during or following these La Nina events. Uh, but again, for a variety of reasons, these are much more difficult to predict. So just like uh, when we looked at freshwater lakes, where there are different zones that we can look at, the zones around the edge of a lake, down to the deeper water areas, uh, we find the same sort of thing when we look at an ocean. There are a variety of environments that we can divide the vertical strata of the ocean into based on the different type of life that exists in those zones. So we go from the intertidal zone down through the benthic environment near the ocean floor and then from the shoreline, the neuritic zone out to the oceanic province which is the open water area beyond the continental shelf. So this figure just visually shows you how these uh, zones are, are spatially related to each other. The intertidal zone may be one of the areas that, that we're familiar with. If, if we ever go visit the ocean, go walk along the tidal pools, see all the different critters living in those tidal pools from the starfish and the anemones to the crab and, and other fish that live in those zones. Uh, the intertidal zone is, is, a, is a harsh environment because again we're looking at ocean uh, the tide being high and low throughout the course of a day so some of these tidal zones are, are underwater and then they're completely exposed to the air. So it takes special sort of adaptations to, to live in that sort of area. Uh, and then we have everything from the shallow benthic environment, again, the, the bottom of the ocean, but in the shallow areas compared to the very deep benthic environments that could be thousands of meters below the surface of the ocean with all the pressure and the darkness and, and all the, again, extreme and environments that are at the very bottom of the ocean. There are still a variety of living things that can survive and thrive down there. And then again, as we move from the shoreline out into the open ocean to the pelagic environment, we also, again, have a variety of life forms that have, have adapted to living out in this open ocean environment. So the book goes through each of these sections, hits some of the highlights. So again, make sure you could, uh, um, you know, discuss a little bit about each of these zones, kind of what they, uh, what type of life they have, what type of issues, things that live in these zones face. So for example, as I mentioned, that intertidal zone is basically along the shoreline between the low and the high tides. And as I said, it's a stressful environment because it goes from being underwater to being exposed to the air. It's a very productive habitat, though, and, and, and uh, consists of everything from sandy beaches to very rocky, brutal kind of shorelines. So everything from, again, very shifting environments where sandy beaches, the sand is always moving, not very much protection, not very much strong anchorage points for living things to again those rocky shorelines where again whether it's plants or animals um, have found a variety of ways to adapt to this 
again, wave action, kind of beating the shoreline, temperature fluctuations, uh, being underwater part of the time, being exposed at low tides. And so again, these organisms that survive and, and thrive in these rocky shorelines in the intertidal zone have uh, come up with a variety of ways to adapt to being dried, dried out on, on, a, on a daily basis. So we can even look at this tidal zone and, and break it down into a variety of sub zones from the supra tidal zone, what's called the splash zone, down to the sub tidal zone, which is uh, basically an area that's always underwater. We look at the benthic environment or the ocean floor Typically, things that live in the sediments are called benthos, and that's kind of where this uh, zone gets its name, benthic. And again, the variety of conditions from the ocean floor, when we look at the intertidal zone, compared to going out to the very deep ocean water trenches that may be a mile or more below the surface of the earth. Again, the bottom of any body of water is going to consist of sediments, typically material that has either been you know eroded into the ocean from the land or and or consisting of all of the living things that have died and settled to the bottom and have been decomposed by all of those decomposers but again typically the sediments are going to consist of everything from sand to mud and you'll have a variety of burrowing things that, that live in the actual sediment. Everything from microscopic bacteria to worms to clams. Even other species of fish that will bury themselves under the sediment. Either to ambush food items or to hide from a predator. And again, this zone is also broken into three subzones. The bathyal, which is the shallowest, the abyssal, you all have to heard, hear the term abyss, the ocean abyss, and then the hadal, or the very deepest um, benthic environments. One of the very important organisms that live in this benthic environment are the corals. These are, are typically in the shallow, warm water areas um, and are hard. Um, they, they're, they're organisms that live within hard shells that are composed of calcium carbonate. So they've got a hard outer protective coating. And um, our plants, or other, they're animals, but they um, require light for symbiotic zo, um, zooxanthellae, which also help them capture food with stinging tentacles. Very productive even in areas of the ocean that don't have very productive water. These organisms are very productive themselves and c create a very diverse environment that can be the home for hundreds of different species of fish and shellfish and other living things. Again, very ecologically important as habitat for all those living things and for those living things that we depend on for food, but also another very ecologically important reason for these corals, and that's to protect the coastlines from erosion. They're basically a, a sort of buffer zone that helps kind of tame the ocean so that it doesn't sort of beat on the coastlines as hard, which again, you got water hitting the shoreline, breaking soil loose, causing it to erode into the ocean. So these uh, um, coral areas are one line of defense. You hear the, um, the, the, the name for the, the, the big coral reef uh, off of Australia, the barrier reef it's called. Barrier, creating a barrier uh, between the ocean and the land. 
and again, because of all the ecological diversity, it's, it's so important to us as humans because of the food it provides, the recreational opportunities. Typically when people go to tropical areas, one of the things they might want to do is, is snorkel or dive around the coral reefs to just see the beauty and the diversity. Uh, but also um, a variety of pharmaceuticals have been um, found that are associated with various life forms that live in and around the coral reefs. And again, as always, there are probably a lot of other things that we just don't fully know or understand yet with respect to the types of values that these coral reefs might have for us or for the overall health and benefit of the planet. Benthic environment also another very important zone within these within the benthic environment are those areas where seagrasses are the dominant plant. These are basically flowering plants, but they live in seawater. They've adapted to living in the ocean. They are in shallow water areas. Again, for them to photosynthesize, since they are still green plants that they need to be in shallow enough water that enough of the sun's light can reach them. So they typically exist in quiet, temperate to tropical waters. We have areas of seagrass in a lot of places off the coast of the United States all the way again through the tropics. And they're very productive. They have a high primary productivity. Again, if there's a lot of food at the bottom of a food chain, which the seagrass would be the bottom of the food chain, then you can have a lot of diversity of animals above it. So again, these are very productive because they are very dominant, um, uh, a very dominant plant in that ecosystem. And again, a lot of other ecological values that these seagrass communities have. They also help stabilize sediments, just by being rooted into the shallow ocean, they keep sediment from moving, thereby reducing erosion. And again, because they're so productive, they provide home and food for a lot of other species of fishes. They provide us with food uh, as well. And um, again, near the coastal areas are typically the areas we depend mostly on for our ocean food. And so again, areas where we have very productive seagrass communities that provide food and habitat for marine organisms that ultimately directly provides food for us as humans. Another productive ecosystem within this benthic environment are kelp. These are the largest and most complex of all varieties of seaweed. They're actually classified as a brown algae and are very common in cooler temperate marine waters. Again, we have a lot of kelp beds off of the coast of California, especially along our rocky shorelines, which we have a lot of. And again, as with the seagrasses, they are um, a primary source of food, primary producers for that ecosystem that they dominate. So like the seagrasses, they provide habitat for a lot of different marine organisms tube worms, sponge, sea cucumbers, clams, crabs, fishes, sea otters, and again, produce a very diverse ecosystem because of how productive the kelp is. Again, if you have a lot of producers, you can have a lot of consumers, which creates a diverse ecosystem. Not only does it benefit the marine organism, the marine environment, but it also, again, benefits us directly in a lot of different ways. If we move out to the Neritic province, which again is part of that pelagic environment, the open ocean environment, the Neritic province is basically uh, the area from the shoreline to a depth of about 200 meters, a little over 600 feet. The living things typically that dominate um, the Neritic province are the organisms that we call floaters, things like plankton, uh, which are the base of the food chain for the open ocean environment, or the swimmers, which we um, also call the nekton. So the plankton, the floaters, which basically are the, the plant, 
uh, and the swimmers or nekton, which basically are the microscopic organisms. Again, both of these are the base of the food chain for, for the neuritic province. We have the euphoric zone, the upper level of the neuritic province, where there's enough light to actually support plants. And so the photoplank, the phytoplankton, as I mentioned uh, above, are the basis of the food webs in the upper levels of the neuritic province. The zooplankton, the microscopic animals, feed on the microscopic plants. So the zooplankton feed on the phytoplankton. And uh, then those zooplankton are eaten by small organisms, which are eaten by larger organisms. Again, providing the food up the food chain. Ultimately, to provide food for the fish and other organisms that live out in the neuritic province. And then we move farther out into the open ocean in the pelagic environment, where now we look at the oceanic province, which is everything deeper than 200 meters. And ultimately, this is the largest marine environment of all of the areas of the ocean, of all the different provinces, uh, from the uh, tidal pools out, the oceanic province is the bulk of the oceans. It's the largest of the marine environments. About 75% of all the water in the ocean is within the oceanic province, which we typically refer to as the deep sea or, or open ocean. Again, we're, we're down hundreds of feet below the surface now, so it's dark, colder water, high pressure, the higher we go up uh, in, in altitude, we get, we get pressure. Um, the, low, the deeper down in the ocean we go, we get more pressure. The, the higher up we go in elevation, we lose pressure. But the deeper down in the ocean we go, we get higher pressure. Again, we got all the weight of, of hundreds of feet of water pushing down on uh, the life that tries to live down there. So clearly, these are some of the most heavily adapted living things. Things that live in complete darkness, that live in an environment where they're always constantly under a very high amount of pressure. We as humans have to build submarines that can take um, you know, that level of pressure just to get down there. But also, this part of the ocean, uh, the oceanic province, is very very low on food basically everything that lives below 600 uh, feet below the surface of the ocean ultimately depends on debris from above you know floating down to this level of the ocean most of the things that live in this part of the ocean are drifting or very slow swimmers uh, they don't have much bone or muscle mass compared to things that have to actively swim or actively pursue prey because they live in complete darkness they often have special organs that produce light um, to, to be able to find each other for reproduction many of them are filter feeders they'll just swim with their mouths open and filter out whatever organic debris might be floating around them and then also there are a lot of them that are scavengers that'll, that'll uh, scavenge along the bottom for whatever uh, happens to have died. Or there are predators, of course, as well, including things like the giant squid that live down at this uh, great depth. As always, um, understanding something like the ocean and all the different parts of the ocean is important. But the other huge part of this is really for, for us to understand the impacts that we have on the ocean. Everything from, again, our, our impact on fish to the fact that we use oceans as travel ways for uh, shipping products across the world, all of the pollution that's generated, developing uh, the coastlines along our oceans, drilling for... Uh, resources like oil offshore, climate change, 
by 2008, it's, it's estimated that less than 4% of our oceans remain unaffected by human activities. Again, we think of the huge volume of the ocean and only about 4% that hasn't been impacted by us. And probably even more alarming is that 41% of our oceans have been seriously harmed by things that we've done to them. So clearly marine pollution, things that we've generated on land and dumped in the ocean, or things that have, uh, have, have created pollution out in the ocean, ships that sink, oil rigs that leak, um, it's really it's really one of those interesting things the perfect example of why we as humans have created such a huge problem for ourselves on this planet we wouldn't um, you know excuse this example but it's the best one I can come up with we wouldn't you know use our toilet and then go dip water out of there to drink it right we have separate sources of water we dump our waste products one place and we get our drinking water from another place but yet we've created this paradox with our oceans we depend on them for food but we use them as a dump we've used them as a dump for as long as we've been on this planet um, before we had the ability to sail across the world or fly across the world we would look out at an ocean and think it's endless now, of course, we know better, but yet, worldwide, we still use our oceans as a dump, but expect them to still provide all of the food that we need. Pollution that we generate has been a greater and greater threat to our fisheries. All, again, all of those seafood species that we depend on for food. Keep in mind that the vast majority of the ocean pollution that's generated comes from things we do on the land, not from things we do out in the ocean. We can have really obvious bad instances like the, the oil rig that leaked in the Gulf of Mexico from uh, a BP rig, and that can be really nasty and draw a lot of attention. But again, it's those everyday activities that, that are occurring worldwide that constantly contribute to the amount of pollution. Again, there'd be no other situation in our personal lives where we would use the same resource to dump garbage in and get our food from. But we do it with the ocean. Again, you can see this image where if you look around the oceans of the world, there are the vast majority of areas where the impact, the human impact on the ocean is medium to high. There are a number of places along certain coastlines, uh, off of, you can see off of Europe, off of the Asian continent, where the impact is very high. A lot of areas, huge open ocean areas, pretty much the entire Atlantic, much of the Pacific, most of the Pacific for that matter, and our southern oceans that have a high level of human impact. And there are very few places, um, some open areas of the southern Pacific, some areas near the polar regions that have a low impact, or, or very, very few regions around the world that have a very low impact. On average, you would probably have to say our our impact is medium high to medium on average worldwide for our oceans. And yet again, we expect these areas to keep doing what they're doing for our, uh, for our benefit. Let's just go back and, and focus on the world fisheries again for a few minutes. Some countries more than others depend on the ocean for a bulk of their food, but worldwide, um, we still expect the ocean to provide food for us. 90% of the world's catch from the ocean is fish, as you might uh, imagine. But um, we also harvest other things like clams and oyster. 
squid and octopus, other mollusks, other shelled creatures. 3% fall into the category of crustaceans, lobster, crab, shrimp. 1% marine algae. Um, there are more and more uses developing for human food, for things like the sea grasses and the kelp. But right now that's a very, very small percentage. So 90% of it is fisheries, fish specifically. And if we look at the world's annual fish harvest, just going back 60 years, we've gone from about 19 million tons a year in excess of 90 million tons of year, a tons a year. Again, most of the fisheries, the commercial fisheries that are really sought after, again, the, the swordfish, the tuna, uh, some of our whitefish, are, are far exceeding the sustainable level now. The real challenge with this, again, is that when you go out into that open ocean, those ocean, open ocean provinces, everybody in the world feels like they uh, own it. No one sort of maybe feels responsible, but everybody feels like they own it, and everybody feels like they have the right to harvest as much as they need or as much as they want. Ultimately, no individual nation has a legal claim to the open ocean. No one can say, well, I, I'm going to sue the world to prove that I own the northern third of the Atlantic Ocean. And so again, because nobody has legal claim, and yet everybody has access to it, we have a, a very high probability, as we've already proven, that these areas are going to be overused and they're going to be degraded. And this goes back to, uh, to the, the concept of the tragedy of the commons. When you have a common resource, everybody's going to want to abuse it and no one's going to want to take responsibility for it. We know there are a lot of species worldwide that have been harvested to the point where they are depleted to the point where they are not sustainable and will not be on this planet in the future if we don't change our perspective on this. We have a very unstable situation for a lot of species because if we're affecting one part of the food chain, you know, whether it's a top predator or something else in the food chain, we're affecting the rest of the food chain. So the more that we deplete certain species from the ocean, the more likely that other species are going to become unstable, that we're going to impact a food web or a bunch of food webs. It's estimated that at least 75% of our world's fish stocks are, are exploited, overexploited, or depleted to the point where, again, they, they may not continue to be on this planet if we don't make a change. We know that, again, our human population continues to grow we need to continue to find ways to provide food. We've um, had huge technological advance, advances from the standpoint of fishing that allow us to be more efficient at catching not only some of the individuals in an area, but maybe even all of the individuals from an area when we're fishing. The technology just allows us to be much more efficient. The downside as well of, of these technologies, not that using nets is a high technology, right? Nets have been around forever. What the technology really is, is, is all the radars and, and all of the other technology that allows us to find the fish at first. And then for us to be able to just focus on those areas. The other downside, which has always been a downside of using nets, which is still the primary way that, that most fish are caught, is that not only do you catch the species you're after, but you also catch bycatch. You also catch things that are unintentional. And then oftentimes, depending on the type of net or how long the net's been set out there, the, the fish may be dead or you may catch marine mammals in the netting and they might drown and uh, then they're just dumped back in the ocean, but it doesn't really matter because they're already dead. It's estimated that 
um, based on the data that we have, as much as one out of every four things that are caught by a commercial fishery is not the species they're after. Again, it's, it's bycatch. It could be something like a dolphin, or it could be a species of fish that's out of season. And again, still that may have been killed by the process. So even if you let it go, it doesn't really matter because it's dead. So as I've already mentioned, uh, a variety of nets, trawls, seines, long lines have become so efficient that we've depopulated fisheries that were once very productive. Again, just one specific example is the cod fishery on the George's Bank. It was closed in 1994 because we had catastrophically depleted the cod population. You can see that around 1990, the population started dropping and they closed the season. But even for the next 10 years, the population continued to drop. And only now are recovering very, very slowly. There's still a lot of concern that they may never recover to the levels prior to when that specific area was closed for fishing. Again, it doesn't mean we, we don't fish for cod elsewhere, but this particular area was closed because of that collapse. And this is only one example that illustrates a trend that we see occurring all around the world with individual fisheries. Any of you who ever watched The Deadliest Catch, when that show first came on TV, they had a very different system for allotting the, um, the amount of catch that they, could, uh, that they could have. The process changed from over time from basically a free-for-all where it was almost as much as anybody could catch to having allotments where, where individuals are given a set amount they can catch and then once it's reached, overall, the season is closed. And again, that is, is more typical now for a lot of the different fisheries. There are quotas, and once those quotas are reached, fishing stops. But again, that doesn't take into account all of the illegal catching that goes on as well. There's still, again, so much of that that continues to deplete certain fisheries. One of the ways that we've uh, tried to or will need to continue to work towards addressing this problem is by aquaculture, basically farming fish, so that we can minimize the demand for the wild fisheries by growing these fish in captivity. Again, we have been doing aquaculture for quite a while. If you eat, if you've ever bought catfish from a store, most likely those were farmed catfish from somewhere in the southeastern United States. Uh, the tilapia, if any of you have ever bought tilapia from a grocery store, that's a species of fish that is farmed in a variety of places around the, uh, around the world. Some of the salmon that we buy now might be uh, farmed fish, and, and typically it'll say on it if it was, uh, you know, wild caught versus farmed or aquaculture, you know, a variety of ways that they might convey that on a label. So we've been doing this for a while, and, uh, and, and certainly we're going to have to continue to look at ways at, um, at, at providing more of our seafood this way. So again, we, we can do this, and we have done this for both fresh and marine species. The more developed countries still, like us, are more likely to harvest fish from the wild, from the open ocean, whereas it's actually the developing nations that are investing more into um, aquaculture. That almost seems backwards to me anyway. You think about it, right? The developed countries would have more money and would be more likely to want to uh, farm fish. But again, it's actually the developing nations that harvest more percentage-wise of their fish using aquaculture. Again, if you start really thinking about why this is, it does make sense. These countries have much more abundant 
cheap labor than the developed countries do. And um, basically the area that's limited to harvest is the area available for farming. So you've got these areas right off the coast or right on the coast and uh, these areas are being set up for, for aquaculture. So it may be an important way for that country to be able to sell fish to their people or maybe even more likely to countries like us. And uh, that may be a way that really supports their economy. But it may not be cost efficient for us to do it because, again, we would have to pay um, a lot more money for the labor. And we also have a lot more stringent environmental rules. Fish farms, as a downside, like with agriculture, you, you grow things, a lot of things, in a very small amount of space. And so for, for fish farming, what this creates is a lot of pollution. Fish waste is pollution, just like when we have um, areas where we, we, we you know, kind of have hold cattle for a period of time and feed them before we uh, send them off to slaughter. You get a high density of animals in a small space. They generate a lot of waste that we have to dispose of. Even though we're out in the ocean or the coastline, we still then have the problem of, of a lot of fish creating a lot of waste that can be at a much higher level than it would normally be, therefore creating a higher level of pollution immediately around this area where aquaculture is occurring. Uh, we are looking more, because of that problem, you know, because of the pollution issue, we are looking more at, at ocean ranching, you know, going farther offshore, out into the deep ocean where the ocean currents might do a better job of dispersing the, uh, the, the buildup of waste products. That way we don't harm the coastlines. But again, so far we have less oversight over this and we, we still are going to have some of those same problems. Again, anytime we, we grow a high density of things, it creates a higher than much, much higher than average or normal density of pollutants, waste products in this case, the waste byproducts of fish that we have to deal with. So again, while that would seem to be an ideal solution, just raise these things in captivity, that still creates a problem or a bunch of problems that we have to deal with. Another huge concern with respect to how we impact the ocean is related to using oceans as highways for shipping, moving products from place to place around the world, the fact that many countries still go offshore to dump their garbage or ships that travel out in the open ocean may dump stuff overboard or, or purge things from the ship that are toxic. Specific types of waste products like plastic that can not degrade for hundreds of years and if that stays in the system it can cause all kinds of problems. There are millions of ships on the ocean at any given time, and a lot of them dump ballast from their um, ballast tanks, where they basically pump water in or pump water out of these tanks to help stabilize the ship. They dump waste products from the onboard latrines or from other storage tanks that may get contaminated. Marpole basically does ban marine pollution from the shipping industry. So there are rules and regulations, again, as to what you can and can't do. But again, there's obviously an enforcement problem. You've got millions of ships, like I just said, out in the open ocean. There aren't going to be ships or helicopters or airplanes following every single vessel that's out in the ocean to be able to tell when they do something they shouldn't do. In 1991, um, we established the Ocean Dumping Ban Act, where in the past cities had uh, previously dumped sewage into the ocean. 
which created a lot of disease issues. Again, we're dumping sewage that contains disease causing agents, which then, again, we go back to that, would you use your toilet water to drink from? No, because it's not healthy. Well, we dump that stuff in the ocean and then eat the shellfish and find out that they're not good for us. So again, we've had this in place for a long time as well. We've had problems and, and concerns about plastic waste for a long time because it doesn't degrade. We can look, unfortunately, at the Pacific Ocean, especially the eastern part of the Pacific Ocean, and we see areas where there is literally garbage floating in these big pools that kind of circulate around and around and around. Some of the more organic waste product does break down, but you've got plastic and other non-biodegradable stuff that is just out there endless, endlessly floating around in circles. And so you get animals that ingest it. Um, they, they don't know it's not food, but they ingest it. It gets stuck in their digestive systems and kills them. You get birds and mammals that get tangled in the plastic. I, I never hear this anymore, but it was one of the biggest things that they tried to promote when I was younger is you know anytime you you have a six pack ring you should always cut it up into pieces and don't leave loops don't leave loops of plastic because it could get into a garbage um, and then animals could get in there and get tangled in it they've done away with a lot of that kind of stuff you know focusing on cardboard packaging but there are still lots of plastic items in our trash and again, whether or not it's loops that, that things can literally get their heads stuck in, those plastic bits that get in our waste stream can literally stay there forever. And when you start getting things that ingest it, it can kill them, aside from being carriers of other toxic chemicals like the PCBs that are used in making these plastics. And then the other one that we'll, we'll, we'll highlight here is, is just the impact of us living on the coast. Just us being there, building homes, filling in marshes, or all the other things we do when we live on the coast, anything that alters or, or destroys a coastal ecosystem can have a bigger impact on that ecosystem's ability to continue providing for all the, the living things that need it. Many coastal areas are overdeveloped, creating recreational areas where people go to. Coastal areas are, we, we create beaches because people want to go swimming on a nice sandy beach. We eliminate a lot of the native areas, the native vegetation, and, and, and make it suitable for us. Sandy beaches or homes that are right up to the ocean. And again, anytime we're living in these areas, we're going to create pollution. And we're going to overfish these areas to provide for the people living there. We have been, again, for a long time thinking about developing cities wisely. But we almost seem to throw that out the window when it comes to coastal development because of how much more money is at stake. An acre right on the coast is going to cost you millions and millions and millions of dollars compared to an acre anywhere else not on the ocean. And so, you know, wealthier people are going to buy these areas. They're going to expect a certain type of lifestyle for living on the ocean. And, um, and then again, those areas are going to be developed because they know people are going to want to go visit these areas. 60% of the world's population already lives within about 90 miles of the coastline. And historically, again, that makes sense. We live near, we settled near where there are resources. And we settle in areas where there is ease of transportation. That's why some of our biggest cities started off near the ocean or along the major rivers. Again, resources, uh, water for providing food, 
and water that allowed us to travel easily before we had airplanes and, and things like that. But it's also then predicted that by 2025, which is not that far in the future now, it might be as high as 75% of the world living that close to the ocean. And again, in, in developed countries, as much pollution as we still generate, compare that to less developed countries where they still dump pollution directly into the ocean because there are no regulations. Earlier we mentioned how important coral reefs are, uh, not only as habitat, but also as a way to help keep erosion down. Coral reef damage exists around the world. 90 of the 109 countries where coral reefs are found are being damaged. We get silt washing into the oceans at a much higher rate, especially near less developed countries where they still clear cut large blocks of forest land and don't have any environmental regulations about replanting those areas. Bleaching from uh, the warming ocean waters at least partially related to the climate change issue. Bleaching basically stresses the coral to the point where they ultimately could die. Changes in salinity. Uh, the more that we take fresh water out of uh, the, the rivers before the rivers dump into the ocean, the higher the salinity levels can be near the coastline. Again, we've talked about that problem in California taking a lot of water out of the Sacramento River system before the Sacramento dumps into the ocean. With less and less fresh water dumping into the ocean, at least near the ocean uh, coastline, you're going to have a slightly higher level of salt concentration. And even though it may not be obvious to us, um, things that have evolved in those conditions oftentimes have a very narrow range of tolerances. And so that higher level of salinity near the coastline is enough in many places to affect the survival of the coral. And then we add to that overfishing of the predators, especially around these coral areas. Tuna, shark, swordfish, those are all predators, top predators. We get rid of predators just like we get rid of wolves on, on the dry land. It can create imbalances for all of the species that they normally eat. And then again, the pollution. All of these things are directly impacting our coral reefs, partly because they're close to the coastline, and, and again, largely because that's where a lot of us live and, um, and yet depend on those areas for our livelihood or our food. And then again, the, the offshore extraction of mineral <clears throat> and energy resources. Largely, we're looking at things like petroleum, but we also have um, manganese that, um, that is mined from under the seafloor. Uh, but we tend to focus on petroleum because, again, it's still a major source of energy worldwide yet it's also a major threat to our ocean's fisheries because a large amount of these resources are out there under the ocean floor we are going to continue to seek these out and continue to develop them just in california there have been a lot of groups lobbying for us to do more offshore oil drilling offshore uh, off the coast of california and largely uh, the environmental groups have really fought this and so far we have uh, not dramatically increased the amount of offshore drilling but there's no doubt that there's going to continue to be lobbying to uh, to tap into these resources that we have locally so that we can continue to be less reliant on other countries for our resources And then, of course, we go back to the, the issue of climate change. We still do not fully understand how great or how small of an impact climate change is going to have on, um, you know, things like the ocean. We know that 
climate change could continue to create rising sea levels because of the glacial melt, the ice pack melting in the far northern and southern parts of the earth. We know that this could create greater flooding along coastlines. We know that if the ocean levels rise, they could infiltrate into the coastal freshwater areas, thereby losing these coastal wetlands. We know that this could increase the risk of flooding and, in general, more saltwater intrusion into our freshwater resources along the ocean. But because we don't know exactly how bad this might be, the, as far as the level uh, of the oceans rising, we don't really know how bad this could be uh, as an overall impact. And again, there are a lot of people that still believe this is not happening or won't happen or won't be bad enough to really cause any problems. The more we learn about climate change, the more we learn about the potential impacts Hopefully, the more that we will uh, create um, panels that will look at ways to solve or address these problems. The biggest one that, that I think a lot of scientists are concerned about is, again, we don't know exactly what serious, how serious the impact will be, but I briefly mentioned this earlier. There is a potential that if climate change were to continue on the direction we think it's headed, that it could be enough to disrupt that whole process of the ocean conveyor belt, which moves heat around the oceans, which therefore, again, creates um, climates that are favorable, or at least I should say have created the climates that we have now. If climate continues to warm in certain areas, it could get to the point where there's no longer enough of a difference between the water temperature and the air temperature to create the conveyor belt that now keeps a major part of Europe at the climate that it's at now. Remember on that figure earlier, we looked at how those ocean currents move up from south to north up the Atlantic Ocean and then as they get up into the European continent the water starts to get colder and because of the ocean currents and the wind currents that colder water then sinks down and moves back south and ultimately that drives the conveyor belt. If there continues to be warming in that part of the world and again, that means that there's not as much of a difference between temperatures that, that that conveyor belt could actually shut down, which ultimately would make that part of the world much colder than it is now. There may be warming in other parts of the world, which could be bad as well, but there can also be major cooling in places like Europe. And then, again, other than the fact on, on that would change the climate and it would change the plant life that lives there. It could affect the animals. It could affect our ability to grow food. It would affect the type of life that lives in the ocean in that area. Even a, another, maybe even bigger concern is that this would also affect the ability of the ocean to sequester CO2. Plant life we typically think of the plants uh, as being the primary thing that takes CO2, again, in the process of photosynthesis. And storing CO2 on the surface of the Earth here is important for the carbon cycle that we talked about earlier. But the ocean also holds, potentially can store a lot of CO2. And if the ocean currents were to change, there might end up continuing to be even more CO2 in the atmosphere, further imbalancing the carbon cycle, further imbalancing warming in certain places, further weakening that conveyor belt to the point where it might completely change life on the planet. Again, the, the problem is that these issues, everything really that we talk about in this class, are, are pretty complex problems. 
And so many of us just want to go hide our head. We don't want to think about it. It hurts our brains to think about how complex these problems are. Which means, again, there are not going to be simple solutions for a complex problem. We have tried to address this in a variety of ways. The UN Convention on the Law of the Sea in 1994 was basically ratified by 157 countries, providing for various things that would allow us to protect our oceans or resources better. In 1995, the UN Fish Stocks Agreement related to the, uh, the regulation of our marine fishing. The Fishery Conservation and Management Act going back to 1977, which was designed to protect fish habitat for over 600 species, which also then helped, would have helped re to reduce overfishing, to rebuild populations of fish, regulations that minimize the bycatch, that established quotas, all of those things that, that have certainly helped and have certainly helped things from becoming extinct already. But again, clearly these, um, these, these various acts and agreements have not solved the problem yet. They have fixed issues and they have solved some problems, but they have not solved the bigger problem yet. We still have fisheries being depleted. We still have habitat being destroyed. We still have problems with bycatch. So we still have a lot of work to do. The U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy in, in, in 2004 reported that we need to continue to create new policies that have better, uh, better decision-making processes, consolidating agencies so that we're doing a better job at oversight instead of having a bunch of individuals doing their own thing. Maybe it's better to have fewer, larger groups to be able to see the big picture, continue to, to gather more data to make stronger science that can generate decisions that help us understand the problem. So there's always going to be a continued need for high quality research to be done, proper scientific methods being followed. Also continue to enhance the education that we do worldwide so that people have a better respect for the ocean and they take a better responsibility each of us again each of us being responsible for everything we do having a greater ethic for for how we treat the environment talking about making environmental education part of the curriculum for all levels this was a question, uh, discussion question, right? Sh is environmental education important? Maybe the question I should have asked is, how soon should we require it? I don't think anybody would say, nah, environmental education isn't important. Why should we care about the environment? Who cares uh, about the environment? Well, we all do, obviously. So maybe a better question would be is, how soon should we start it at kindergarten or preschool? Should we wait till later when kids are old enough to really understand it? Ultimately, none of that's going to matter if, if the parents don't also understand it, right? A kid could come home and say, hey, dad, you know, we should um, start recycling all of our newspaper instead of uh, throwing it away. If it isn't part of the culture in your home, it's going to be hard to become part of the culture of our kids. So, yeah, it should be formal education in school. Again, we could argue whether kindergarten is too early or too late, but it has to be part of all of our lives. I guess the bottom line is if we start somewhere, if we start today with our kindergartners or our preschoolers or our K through 6 students, K through 8 students, then maybe the next generation or the next generation it will be part of the culture in the home but again that's really what has to happen it has to be part of everybody's culture who they are what they do it has to just be part of something you don't even think about you just do it 
So there's no doubt that if, if we continue to have these problems, which it's inevitable that we will, we may have to establish ocean reserves, which we do have, but areas where we don't allow, allow harvesting of anything. We may have to reduce our fishing fleet to continue to limit the number of people or permits that we allow to harvest these commercial products. We may have to remove any subsidies we have People that couldn't afford or can't make a living without being subsidized by the government, maybe they need to find a different livelihood. Again, I know that's easy for me to say. If, if it's your livelihood, it's, it's hard to say, well, you can't make a living anymore doing that. Especially when it's been your family's 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 uh, way of making a livelihood. We've gone through the same growing pains with logging. Northern California, that, that is still, timber is still the primary product from Northern California. And when I say Northern California, I mean the real Northern California. Jasta, Tehama, Trinity, you know, us, our area of Northern California, north of Sacramento. But, um, but we've had to suffer a reduction in that as being a form of livelihood for a lot of people whose parents and grandparents were in the timber industry. So it's going to have to be the same for the fishing industry and for a lot of other industries probably as well. And we're going to have to continue to have an ecosystem based approach to focus on preserving the health of an environment so that it functions and provides us not only with food, but more importantly, with a healthy environment to live in. Less than 5% of our marine environments have been protected with very much success because we're talking about huge areas, because we're talking about places that nobody owns but everybody wants access to. So bigger, a bigger challenge than our land area because people, countries, specifically own land, but they don't specifically own the ocean. So it's going to be a much greater challenge in the future with our oceans. And then your book talks about this, this area called a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. Because of all the runoff uh, into the Mississippi River, particularly because of uh, oh, things like agricultural runoff and manufacturing runoff of things like nitrogen and phosphorus, you get such a uh, such a heavy growth of algae and they grow rapidly they die rapidly which means they sink they decompose they deplete the water through the process of decomposition which creates this hypoxic zone so it's not the algae living in an area it's when they die and the process of decomposition uses so much oxygen that it can deplete the oxygen so there's not enough for other living things. And so then you have only the anaerobic bacteria, the bacteria that don't use oxygen in their, in their survival process. And so from March to September, you basically have zones where there is no living things other than this anaerobic bacteria. <clears throat> and then when you throw climate change into that, you can make these dead zones even bigger even if you don't have runoff of nitrogen and phosphorus to fuel them. If these areas expand and as the Mississippi River dumps out into the ocean, you can continue to have these threats to biodiversity in the river and also in those coastal zones. And this image kind of shows that zone that we're talking about, the red areas, are the worst and then as we move out into the orange and yellow and green the, the the effect lessens but you can see it's worse right around the coast of Louisiana where the Mississippi River dumps but you can also see the effect extending hundreds of miles along the coast of Texas and the other direction to a lesser extent because of the Gulf Coast current uh, into Alabama and Mississippi. But again, all of that is because of that impact um, happening in the Mississippi River 
and how big of an area that impacts as the Mississippi flows out into the ocean.